Let's open our Bibles together to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. When my, when my children were, were young, we began a tradition in our home that ultimately we brought to, to this church, which was to read a passage of Scripture. We normally would do that on uh, Christmas Eve. We used to celebrate Christmas Eve as a family. And uh, I would uh, have the children sitting around, and uh, I wanted to teach them something early. I wanted them to, to learn that Christmas wasn't about them. You know, I think that presents are great, and who doesn't appreciate a good present or two? I'm still receiving them, by the way. And um, <laughs> presents are great. I mean, it's a great thing to be able to give to somebody else and to receive. But I wanted them to know that Christmas was more than, than a tree and lights and everything that we associate with that particular holiday in the sense of uh, the presents and things of that nature. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to teach them the significance from a very early age. So from the time they were very small, we would gather together and I would read this passage that we're going to be looking at today. And I wouldn't give them a full teaching as I'm going to try to do this morning with you, but I would give to them the things that I believed were very important for them to think about. And uh, in that manner, they would be able to learn the significance of the birth of Jesus Christ and why it's so important for us to worship him and uh, why he deserves that. Uh, we would have them pray before they opened a gift. And on Christmas, uh, more, uh, rather Christmas Eve, I would have a prayer. I would thank God and, uh, for providing for us. And then I would have uh, them open one present at a time. And they only actually on Christmas Eve opened one present. So they were able to go and select the one that they wanted to, to open. And then I would have one open the present while the others watched because I wanted to teach them that there's joy in receiving and joy in participating in somebody else receiving. And you know how it can be with the kids. You know, they go, they grab their presents, they stack them up, you know, they kind of form a fort, you know, and, and they just tear into it, leave a mess for mom and dad to pick up later on. I wanted to try and train them that they could not only receive but appreciate what somebody else had received and also to appreciate what they had given to somebody else. And so we've worked real hard for all of their young lives to teach them that basic thing. And I get all of that from just the fact that God so loved that he gave. And I wanted people to know, I wanted my children to know that uh, the greatest present that they could ever receive wasn't going to be found under a tree. I wanted them to realize the greatest, greatest gift that they could ever have was a gift that God gave to them, his son, Jesus Christ. And um, as much as I appreciate Christmas and the holidays and all, we've done our best to, to remove the commercialism from it so that the children would always know, as they're now adults raising their own children, some, I would like to... Uh, believe that we succeeded in training them in that. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at Luke chapter 2 together. I can't help but think that last night was a great service for those who were with us. It was a beautiful time of worship and praise. This morning was wonderful. I am so blessed to see you guys got up and came to church on Christmas Day. I mean, of all days, why not Christmas Day? But thank God you're here. Bless you. Bless you for being here. May the Lord bless you for uh, putting him first. That, that's wonderful. In Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. 
Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known that the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who's, who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. When you pick up in Luke chapter 2, some background so that we might see the context of this passage. When you pick up in Luke chapter 2, we know that for over 400 years, God had been silent towards the nation of Israel. God had ceased speaking to them when the book of Malachi had been written. And now four centuries of silence have occurred, but he's ready to break his silence. And God is now, as we see this in Luke chapter 2, ready to keep his promise to his covenant people. God had made a promise to them. He had stated that the Messiah would be born in a small village, a village called Bethlehem. Over 700 years before, through the prophet Micah, God had said, You Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And so Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. But how can a resident of Nazareth, which is to the north, how can a resident of Nazareth be moved to go to Bethlehem? Well, the way God moved that is that he simply moved the heart of a petty tyrant and he directed him to order a census. The Bible in Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And so God moved the heart of this tyrant to order a census. And so even though the people more than likely did not want to take the journey, God used this time for good. The Bible tells us here that Caesar Augustus had issued a decree that all of the Roman Empire should be registered. In other words, there were to be a census to be taken where their names and their property and their income was all to be registered in order that they might be able to levy taxes easier. And that's how he moved him to go from the, Nazareth, the city of Nazareth to the north down south to Bethlehem. And so as this is taking place, verse 4 tells us, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who, who was with child. And so Mary's espoused husband, Joseph, was a descendant, a descendant of King David. And King David had been born in Bethlehem. And so the Jews would keep track of their genealogies, and he knew that if he was going to go, he had to go to the, to the city of his father, David. And so he came from Nazareth and went up to Bethlehem. Now, by law, Mary didn't have to go. Joseph could have gone on his own, but Mary went with him. She didn't have to go for several reasons. One, her time to give birth was close, close at hand. Joseph, uh, Joseph wouldn't want to leave her, so he brought her with him. And secondly, he wouldn't want to leave her alone because of how she had been uh, treated and how she would be treated while he was gone. And then third, it may be that Joseph knew that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem because he knew that his wife was with child of the Holy Spirit. And so this is something that God had moved him to do, and she came with him, and uh, they made their journey down to Bethlehem. It says in verses 6 and 7, uh, while she was there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Now, as she shows up, there's no room for her in the inn. 
nobody would give up their room. So they were forced to lodge in an outdoor stable. And so as she was there in this outdoor stable, the Bible says in verse 7 that she brought forth her firstborn son and she wrapped him in swaddling cloths. And so there they are in this place. There's no room in an inn. They go into an outdoor stable. She gives birth there. She's the one who brought forth this child. She places him in a manger. I want to show a couple things to you real quickly here as we look at this, though. I want you to notice how it speaks concerning Jesus being her firstborn. Verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger. There was no room for them in the inn. And so I'd like to note with you two things. One, she brought forth what is referred to as her firstborn son. In other words, he's the first child that she gave birth to. The Bible makes it very clear that she had other sons and daughters. Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 and 56 asks the question, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And so Jesus had other brothers and sisters, as Scripture says. What's interesting is his brothers did not believe in him until after the resurrection. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared before James, as it states in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, and the book of Jude was written by one of the brothers of Jesus. We know that James wrote the book of James. And so one, he had brothers and sisters. He's the firstborn of them. But also it speaks of him being preeminent. Jesus is above all things. This is intended to communicate to us his glory and his greatness. Colossians 1.15 says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so Jesus is preeminent. Now, when he's born, notice verse 7, she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and personally laid him in a manger. I was reading concerning swaddling cloths. Let me read to you something that I, that I, uh, I read on this very quickly. When the son of a king was born, that child was wrapped in swaddling cloths after being washed gently with water, having a small portion of salt in it. The salt symbolized the qualities of truth and honesty and was used so that the child would grow up speaking words that were salted. The swaddling cloths were narrow strips of fine linen cloth, about two inches wide, which were wrapped around the baby's body. The child was wrapped from head to foot with only a part of his face left uncovered so he could breathe. The baby's body and limbs were thus held very straight. This was to indicate that he would grow up to be free from crookedness and waywardness, that he would walk straight and tall. The swaddling cloths were left on the baby for a time while the parents took time to pray and make their commitment to God concerning the upbringing of the child. Going on, it says, in the Middle East, people traveling long distances were often met with many hardships and trials on their journeys. In the event of a, of a death in travel, the body could not continue to be transported for many days. For that reason, travelers wrapped a thin, gauze-like cloth around their waist many times. If someone died on the journey, the others would use this cloth, referred to as swaddling cloths, to wrap the corpse in before burying them. When Jesus was born, there was no room in the inn, so Mary and Joseph used a nearby stable for Jesus' birth. With no other cloth to use, Jesus was wrapped in Joseph's swaddling cloths, the cloth normally reserved for a person's death. So the King of kings and Lord of lords came into this world in a lowly manger, was wrapped with burial clothes. In truth, he was born to die, to die for the sins of all mankind. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ was wrapped in swaddling cloths, it really was a prefigurement of the fact that he would live in order that he might give up his life. She laid him in a manger, verse 7 says, where the animals fed. That tells us how filthy that manger was. It, he was placed in a manger as a reminder that people can act like beasts. But even those who act like a beast can partake in bread of life. We also know that around that manger would have been, because animals being what animals are, it would have been filthy, it would have been filled with dung. But that was a symbol of the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was willing to be amongst that. There was no room for them in this inn. There wasn't even room for Mary in a stable. But there she is out there giving birth to this baby. Now, in verse 8, it says, Now there 
were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For it is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so the birth of Jesus Christ. These shepherds may have been keeping sheep that were used as substitutionary offerings. That would have been a picture of Jesus who has come to be a sin offering. The shepherds were a despised class because they weren't able to keep the law. They normally were not schooled in the law of Moses. They were considered by people to be ignorant. Yet in the ordinary event of their life, an extraordinary thing occurred. God invades the ordinary. This angel stood before them. As they were going about their ordinary tasks and their service, there was a revelation that God gave to them. And, and by the way, that still happens to this day. The Lord still breaks into the ordinary of our lives to show us something extraordinary. We can go through various things, various life. We can just be alive, and God will break into our life in one form or another, and he'll reveal himself to us. He can do it on the job site. He can do it in the house. He, he can do it in a church service. He can do it when you're, when you're driving in your car and you happen to turn the radio on and you listen to a message that speaks to your heart. He can break into the ordinary events of your life, and that's what took place. And as they were there keeping sheep by night, they see the Shekinah glory of God. And as they do so, their, their hearts begin to tremble in fear. These are people who would have been aware of the stories of miracles. They knew that the nation of Israel had angelic visitation. They had the men like Abraham and Gideon and Daniel who had expressed through their word that they had seen these angelic beings. But now the Bible is coming alive. There's an angel that is standing right before them, and they begin to fear for their life. And the angel speaks, do not be afraid, in verse 10. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Don't be afraid. Even though it is natural for you to be afraid, you're seeing something great, something beyond understanding. But your fear is going to be transformed into joy because the hope of the centuries has now been fulfilled. Messiah has been born. Because, he says in verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He's born to you. A savior. Only sinners need saviors. Every human being born is born with a sin nature. We sin because we have a sin nature. It's natural for me to sin. Funny thing about it is I usually don't think that sin is that bad. I really don't think in terms of things that I do as being that bad. Most people, I, I would assume, are pretty much in their own sight pretty good. It's kind of like we're all, when it comes to our quality of life, it's kind of like we're like American Idol type people. You've seen the uh, American Idols, right? Where they'll say, can you sing? Oh, yeah, I sing like Aretha Franklin. Then they go out there and they sing and it makes you cry. You know, it's that bad. We all think that if you gave to us a scale of 1 to 10, what our talents are, we're normally 7, 8, or 9. Some people consider themselves a 10, but with humility, they reduce it to a 9 because they know they're not perfect. They're just getting there. And so there are a lot of us who think that we're a lot better than we actually are. That's just natural. That's human nature. If you speak to them, though, and you, and you speak honestly and say, can we have a real conversation for just a moment? Can we, can we talk about quality? Can we talk about morals? Can we speak of these things? And if they will give to you a moment that they might be honest with you, and you begin to ask them a question, if you ask them uh, if you were able to go and you found a uh, you know, a vault that was open. Nobody is around. There's no cameras. Nobody's watching you. The vault is so filled with money that if you took a million dollars out of it, nobody would even notice it. And, and would you do that? Would you go and would you take that million dollars? If you knew that nobody would even notice it, would you take it? And most people that you'd speak to on the street would say, nobody knows I'm going to take it. Nobody's going to miss it. There's so much money in there that you wouldn't even notice that sum of money being taken. Yes, nobody's going to know. You walk in, you see millions upon millions of dollars there, and you can take a million dollars if you want, and nobody will know that you took that ever. Only you will know that you took it. Would you take it? The average person on the street would say, what's wrong with you? Are you a fool? Of course I take it. And so you ask them, does it belong to you? No, it doesn't. 
Okay, then, what does that make you? And they say, well, that makes me smart. No, what that makes you is that makes you a thief. And do you believe that thieves go to heaven? You know, most of us in this room will never have an opportunity to go and steal a million dollars with nobody finding it. And there are those who would say, that, you know, that, that's really no big deal. You know, I really don't steal anyway. So you say, well, do you ever pirate music off the Internet? Well, you know, that's, that's not really stealing now, is it? And you have conversations related to that. And the fact is that all of the laws that gave, God gave to us, we have either, either in, in deed or in thought broken. You know, we, we, we have lusted after somebody else. We have lied. We have stolen. We have done those things. God's standard for, for heaven isn't doing your best. God's standard to enter into heaven, which the majority of Americans to this day still believe exists. God's standard for entrance into heaven is not because you tried to be nice or you were good or you went to church once in a while. We already know that. God's standard is perfection. Every human being needs a savior. Every one of us do. And that's why God provided that for us. Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned. We are by nature sinners. That's just a fact. Nobody in this room would ever deny that they have done wrong. Every one of us knows that we have a conscience. And we're able to say, yeah, there were times when my mom said not to do this, and I did it anyway. Or my dad said not to do this, and I did it anyway. I have violated. I have broken. I am a criminal in God's sight. That's why we rejoice over a Savior. This, for this day, there has been born a Savior, Christ, who is the Lord. He is the one who's going to confront the sin of the world. There's one who's born to you who will one day conquer Satan, and one day he will rule. And notice with me again that the angel stated very clearly he is the Savior. He is Christ the Lord. And so Jesus was identified to these shepherds as the anointed one. And he goes on to say in verse 12, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. In a moment of time, we receive an understanding that changes our lives. One, there is no peace on earth except among those with whom God is well pleased. Two, we understand that men are in a state of constant hostility with heaven and that spills over into our relationships with one another. But three, we know that God has provided a way of peace and he did that through his son. So when men become reconciled to God through the death of Jesus, men can do something that they really desire to do and that is we can begin to love one another. Now, when the angels had gone away, it was told to them, according to verse 15, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known that saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things things and pondered them in her heart the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them that took place 2,000 years ago we're gathered here this morning to simply recall with those shepherds their testimony God has broken into humanity he took upon himself human flesh he was born of a virgin Jesus Christ lived in order that he might demonstrate to us the way because he is that way. This baby that was placed in a manger as a man was placed on a cross. And Jesus Christ, when he gave up his life for us, made the joy of salvation possible. When I gave my heart to the Lord 42 years ago this month, that's been the one thing I've been trying to learn. It's the one thing that God has been trying to teach me, that without him I can do nothing but through him I can do all things. Without him, I don't have an ounce of joy, but in him, I have joy unspeakable. Without him, I have no hope, but Jesus Christ is my hope. Without him, I have no life, but Jesus Christ is my life. And that's what Christmas is all about. I've never been satisfied with a present under a tree, 
but I have been satisfied with a man on a tree, Jesus Christ, who laid his life down for me. He was born that he might die in order that I might have an enjoyable life with him, not only here on the face of the earth, but in heaven with him. And that's what we do on Christmas. We celebrate the reality of the life that God gave to us through Jesus. It's not a story. It's not a myth. It's not a fable. It is a fact. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Of all the gifts that we could receive, the greatest gift that we have received is the gift of eternal life, something I didn't have to pay for, something he shed his blood to give to me. How can I do anything but worship and thank him? How could I live in any other way than to praise him all my days? And guess what? To do that into eternity, all the days that are before us, worshiping and praising him, because 2,000 years ago, a young virgin was with child, gave birth to the Savior, laid his life down for me, that I might have eternal life. You can't beat that for gifts. You can't beat that for joy. That comes through Jesus Christ.